Hello again, Salem. This is William Legault here at the Salem Access Television Studios on 285 Derby Street. And we're bringing you yet another candidate interview because 2021 was an election year, and here we are in 2022, and we're electing people again. It's a bad habit, but here we are. There's nothing we can do about it. So we have with us today uh, Salem School Committee member Manny Cruz, who is running to succeed Paul Tucker as the state representative in the 8th district or is this the 6th district? 7th Essex. 7th Essex. I get them confused with the federal districts all the time. Um, Manny's been on the school committee for two terms, but now serving his third. Uh, I am in my second term. See, it just shows you I don't have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't know why I'm even doing this. <laughs> so, and uh, you've decided to move on, which is a bit of a step. Uh, without a doubt, it's a big step going from uh, a small city council into a very large legislature, 400 and something members. So it's a big step for anybody. You're moving from the intimate setting of a local school committee. What do you think in your experience, Manny, is preparing you to work closely in a collaborative effort with such a large body of elected representatives? Well, thank you, Bill, uh, for taking the time to run these interviews and uh, for all that you've done to really elevate the civic discourse in our city. I think that uh, my experience on the school committee is certainly different uh, from what we see on Beacon Hill in the legislature, I'm talking about 160 members of the House of Representatives, 40 members of the Senate, and then you're also uh, in the legislative process dealing with the governor and the administration. And this role is, I think, really unique in the sense that uh, it does build off of some of the local experience that someone might bring uh, in the sense that this is really about the relationships that you can build with your colleagues uh, to work on some of the big issues that our Commonwealth is facing. And my experience uh, as uh, a legislative staffer within that building is really formative and I would say really gives me an advantage coming into the legislature because I understand the legislative process, I've seen how it works behind the scenes, uh, and then additionally, I know what effective policy making looks like. Uh, and aside from that role, working in Representative Tucker's office for a couple of years, and then for another state representative, uh, I've had the experience of being on the outside of Beacon Hill uh, doing advocacy work. So I previously, uh, when I was a youth leader, uh, was appointed to serve on Governor Patrick's statewide youth council. For two years, I served as chair and we tackled issues impacting young people in our commonwealth. So everything ranging from public education, housing, health care, and youth violence. Uh, and then in my current capacity, I'm currently the advocacy director at a nonprofit called Latinos for Education, uh, where I lead our coalition work that is focused on Beacon Hill and passing legislation and key budgetary investments. Uh, and so I currently lead what is known as the Educator Diversity Coalition, which is a coalition of over 50 organizations dedicated to uh, diversifying our educator pipeline so that our Commonwealth's uh, public educator force will better reflect the diversity of our student population. Uh, and then additionally, uh, in that role, I'm also uh, a leader in a coalition called the Early College Coalition, uh, in which we're trying to transform our higher education system by making it student ready and having our high school students who are first generation be uh, exposed to the college experience while they're still in their high school settings, getting support from the dedicated staff and some nonprofit partners. And it was a pilot program that's now grown into um, a really fully fledged program that's serving over 8,000 students, uh, but our goal is to get to 45,000 students served because from what the data tells us, this program is a great intervention for those first generation of college students. And then lastly, at Latinos for Education, I've been leading our efforts uh, here in the state around broadband equity. What we saw during the pandemic, I left the legislature at the height of the pandemic, still serving on the school committee. I saw every single day the challenges that families were experiencing trying to get their students engaged in the online learning. And we led a statewide campaign to try to get greater device access, but also pursued statewide policy uh, in the budget. Uh, we established what was known as the Broadband Equity Commission. Uh, and one of the key recommendations that resulted from that work was a $50 million uh, investment in broadband innovation uh, throughout our gateway cities, which are where the greatest disparities in connection exist. So as I think about my professional experience, uh, it certainly equips me to do the job, but then I also think about the relationships that I hold. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a coalition that I'm building right now in my race. I've got over 40 state representatives, senators, 
that are endorsing my candidacy because they've seen the work that I've done on Beacon Hill and the way that I can bring, bring people together on an issue. Uh, and then additionally, I have some great support here at home. I've got 21 current and former elected officials from Salem who are standing by my candidacy because they remember working with me on Beacon Hill when I served with Representative Tucker and they know the type of advocacy that I bring for our community uh, to a place like Beacon Hill. So I think that the collective experience that I've had both inside and outside of the building uh, make me best suited to lead in this position. We're going to let you catch your breath now because that brings <laughs> up two follow-up questions. Uh, now you worked for Representative Tucker and did you work for Senator Lovely too for a short time? I worked for State Representative Juana Matias of That's Lawrence. right. Okay, you worked for a state, another state rep, then you worked for Sen uh, rep Representative Tucker. How long did you, did you work for the reps total? Uh, uh, four years on Beacon Hill. Four years on Beacon Hill, That's various right. things, including working for two, two separate state representatives. That's correct. Okay, so you went right off into education too on that, which is very, very important, of course, which, for your role in the school committee. And you brought up the broadband equity or no equity. Uh, that was a major issue, obviously. Do you think, especially with your perspective after working a couple of terms as a school committee, is Salem, but not just Salem, as a state, are we actually preparing the majority of our students for life after school, after high school, whether it be going to college, whether it be pursuing a trade uh, or anything else? Are we actually doing that right? Uh, the things that we, uh, what are we not doing? It's a great question, Bill. And this is the time to reimagine education in the state that leads uh, in public education. And Massachusetts is ranked by all indications as number one, but it's really only for some. When we take a look at the subgroups of students, students of color, students with disabilities, we find that on our assessments that those students are not being served as well as their counterparts that are wealthier um, and white. Uh, and what that tells me is that we have a lot more learning to do uh, about what really serves our students best. And when it comes to this conversation about reimagining public education and what it is that we're doing and what we're not doing, I think number one, innovation has to be the forefront of what our state uh, needs to put forward and there are models that we can take a look at that we know are highly effective for our students uh, at the state level. So one thing that I would certainly raise up my work on the early college. Uh, this is a program that again is dedicated to underserved students. Students who have no family members that have gone to college. The majority of them are black, Latino, um, or they're low income. And this particular program at the moment it offers about 16 college credits uh, but all the supports that come with being in your school building and our goal is to get this program to serve 45,000 students across the Commonwealth in our coalition that I currently serve on uh, in the next five years. Now why is this program so groundbreaking? Um, not, it's not about the credits, it's really about instilling the confidence and the skill sets and the exposure for students. I think about my own experience in high school, if it wasn't for the Boys and Girls Club and Leap for Education taking me on a college tour at a time in which I had a 2.3 GPA, I probably wouldn't have believed that I could be in that space. Uh, and they were really intentional about how they built out my experience. And that's not something that we always do for all of our kids. Um, some of our kids fall through the cracks, but this program is designed to catch them. Uh, and right now, one of the things that we're pushing for within the early college program is to get it to serve more students, but also to add more credits. So 30 to 60 credits is what we'd love to see every single graduate in the Commonwealth from an early college program receive. That would be a game changer for our kids to have the skill set, the confidence, and the ability to believe that they could complete college. And you think about the cost that it costs to attend, uh, the concerns around uh, whether or not our students could have a debt-free future. I mean, this is a, a, a clear winner. And right now in the legislature, there are several bills that are kicking around that would scale up early college and lead to some key uh, budgetary investments as well that make sure that our students could be well served. But there's a couple other areas that I would point to. Um, not every student is gonna go to college. Right. And I was a career vocational technical education student. And we have these regional voc techs. And the paradigm has completely shifted in our career vocational technical education schools in which uh, 30 years ago, if you were to look at them and the demographics, they were serving primarily low income students 
who had no intention of going to college, but they wanted to go into trades which were high paying, had great benefits, and you could really make a living off of them. If you fast forward to today and you take a look at some of the same uh, demographics, you'll find that they've completely shifted. It's a lot more wealthier students that are getting in, um, and those students are pursuing academic opportunities rather than the career vocational technical education aspects. And a lot of that has to do with the admissions process, which is state um, regulated, and that's an area where we can do some reforms to ensure that there is greater equity uh, in the admissions to allow for more students who are actually intending to pursue the trades uh, to go after them. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that every student that goes to a career vocational technical education school has to go into the trades, uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure that if there's a kid that wants to, that they should be able to, but we should also double down on that investment within our comprehensive high schools as well. Uh, right now at the Salem Public Schools, 50% of our students want to go into the trades. Uh, they're in our career vocational technical education programs. So what that signals to me is that as we think about the Massachusetts School Building Authority, uh, the infrastructure bill that's coming in from the federal government, uh, and then uh, some of the state dollars that might come to uh, a place like Salem, um, this is an opportunity for us to invest in what the kids are telling us they want. Uh, and so I would love to file legislation that first of all, opens up Chapter 74 a little bit more uh, so that we can get greater access in our comprehensive high schools, not to replicate what they're doing at Essex Tech, but to build our own programs that would serve the needs of our kids. Uh, and then the other space that I would say is really important when we talk about public education, it's the great equalizer in our society is access to universal pre-K. Uh, there's a bill right now in the legislature, I'm a part of a coalition called the Common Start Coalition, uh, and that's the name of the bill. Uh, and that particular legislation would set up a first of its kind actual state system for early education that number one would help with uh, addressing some of the workforce challenges that we're seeing right now in early ed. It's really hard to find folks, the pay rates are incredibly low, the professional development always isn't always geared towards the learning, uh, but then additionally would open up some additional seats, uh, which would be critically important. So if that bill, for whatever reason, isn't able to get over the finish line, you know, that'd be one of the first things that I'd want to advocate for uh, if I was to arrive on Beacon Hill, because we know that if we can get a kid reading by the time they reach kindergarten uh, and uh, by third grade on grade level, that that's an indicator for future success. So those are kind of three areas that I would point to uh, that we need to look at when it comes to education reform. So you're looking to narrow the gaps. Well, we'll never eliminate the gaps, much as we want to. The gaps in education, the gaps in everything, they're always going to be there. But you're basically looking to narrow those gaps at both ends, preschool, pre pre-K, and up at the other end. Ideally, of course, you want to close those gaps completely, but almost, almost impossible, I think. Uh, Let's move on to uh, question two, if you don't mind. Uh, the legislature is looking at more COVID relief. I don't know how thoroughly, thoroughly they're looking at it. For the many and small, medium-sized businesses in Massachusetts that are still struggling to recover from this pandemic, which just doesn't seem to want to quit. Uh, the feds basically decided not to do that. Do you think that, what, what kind of uh, support, what kind of aid do you think we should be, 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 uh, be providing to the smaller in the medium-sized businesses, not only in Salem, but across the state. They took the biggest hit uh, from COVID as opposed to the, the bigger businesses that took advantages of the loans that were available too. Yeah, this is one of the most pressing issues that we face right now with high rates of inflation, um, uncertainty about the economic outlook of the rest of the country. Uh, I think it's really critical for us as a commonwealth to lead on this issue. Uh, so there's a couple things that I would point to. Number one, uh, the state has put away $2 billion out of the American Rescue Plan uh, that we received uh, last year as part of the stimulus. And so what we could do is we could take that $2 billion and we could certainly build out a package that's targeted at some of the small businesses, and I, when I say small, I mean small businesses, not the major corporations that identify with over 100 employees uh, and are able to collect on some of those loans that you referenced. And I think about who was left out during the pandemic. Uh, it was your mom and pop shops that couldn't apply for funding. It was your restaurants, it was your local retailers um, and entrepreneurs who were really struggling to find the federal resources that they could access. Uh, and the federal government did a few things right. They established a revitalization fund for restaurants uh, after hearing from the industry, but it was very clear, uh, and I experienced this when I was in Rep Tucker's office, um, that there were a lot of uh, businesses in Salem that were completely left out of that funding. 
and they really needed it to be able to grow, to pay their employees, uh, and to have some certainty that they had something that they could fall back on. Uh, and so I would love to see that $2 billion um, and a portion of it allocated towards uh, thinking about the next recession, which could be on the horizon. Some people say it's here. Yeah, and some people are saying it's here. And so to that end, the, the legislature has already taken up its budget, but it's entirely possible that they could take up the ARPA spending again next year. So I'd love to see a fund established that uh, is targeted at your micro businesses, your entrepreneurs, and the real small businesses in our community that weren't able to access federal funding for other reasons, uh, but then additionally our existing businesses that were able to fund uh, access those funds, they still need the support and the help. Um, and those could go towards their operating costs, uh, but I think the other piece about um, the challenges that we're seeing are also tied to the workforce. There's a lot of folks that haven't uh, returned to work for a variety of different reasons, and not every company is in a position to build out retention bonuses or some of the things that we are seeing uh, that are attracting workers to come back. And so I would love to uh, also advocate for some of this funding to be allocated towards investments in the workforce, job training programs, uh, being able to subsidize um, some unique opportunities like childcare in certain institutions uh, that might be looking to do that. Uh, and then additionally, uh, I'd love uh, for some of that funding to be used uh, towards some of the creative solutions that we're seeing work retention bonuses that are tied to a, uh, a particular uh, point within someone's time at a company. Uh, and then additionally, there's one more area that I know that keeps uh, our small business community up at night, and that's unemployment insurance. Uh, there oh. are some really growing concerns that unemployment insurance uh, isn't solvent. We saw that there was uh, some challenges with administrating that, uh, and we had employers who were calling the state, trying to figure out how do I get my employees to help and then you had an international fraud ring that was going around and taking resources away from our residents in the Commonwealth. So I would break that up into, number one, we need to make sure that we're putting in stronger safeguards to ensure that the unemployment fund is solvent. Number two, we need some greater accountability uh, to make sure that this isn't something that folks feel like they can live off of for a substantial period of time, but rather as a resource that keeps them, um, keeps them going. But that the job training is a little bit more robust in the event that their employer maybe folds. You know, I think that that was something that we didn't foresee how many businesses were wiped out here in the Commonwealth and then people that were looking for jobs but not necessarily building skills at the same time, they weren't building up their competencies. So when the new market opened up, they weren't as competitive as other folks because they had been out of work. Uh, and then I do think uh, as a Commonwealth, we need to reconcile with the fact that that international fraud ring stole millions of dollars from our residents. And how, how are we gonna recoup those dollars uh, for our residents? So I think we do need a transparent accounting of that. Uh, I think often about the taxpayers, but also our small businesses who are negatively impacted by that. So during COVID, some of the loans were, ba were specifically payroll loans, the PPE loans. They issued them initially with one set of compliance rules, and then they kind of changed them a little bit later where they didn't have to go completely into payroll. But uh, one of the main issues for small businesses is how much you pay people. Uh, what can you afford to pay people? The city is experiencing the same problems. I was at the budget meeting last night. The city is losing employees to other communities that are offering higher salaries. So now Salem is needing to raise salaries. And this is, this is across all levels. Uh, do you think, uh, would you think that payroll specific loans would be a way to go uh, moving forward? Yeah, I would certainly argue that uh, it's time for us to really get creative about how we retain employees. We've experienced two things at the same time, the great retirement and the great resignation. We saw folks leaving the workforce in droves for a variety of different reasons, and one of them is certainly around the salaries that they were receiving. So when it comes to our municipal um, piece here, now we're talking about whether or not there could be a creative fund that could support local aid that could come in and help uh, cities either boost their salaries, provide uh, retention bonuses, um, and or help cities create new positions that might help create leadership pipelines within your community. But when it comes to the private sector, absolutely, I think we need to be thinking about some type of payroll incentives that would help people either with sign-on bonuses, retention bonuses that would really attract them to stay at particular companies or uh, to go into where they're needed most, which is our gateway cities like Salem. Absolutely. Uh, 
It also, this conversation causes me to think about, you mentioned unemployment insurance, obviously a huge expense for any employer. Uh, what about health insurance? Uh, a lot of businesses, they hire people, they limit them to 30, 32 hours, 36 hours. They, they don't let them get those 40 hours, two we uh, 36 hours, two weeks in a row or whatever. Uh, big problem, not just locally, but uh, across the nation. What can be done at the legislative level to, I'm not going to say level the playing field, uh, make it a fairer playing field, not only for the businesses and what they have to pay, but for the employees and what they have to pay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a great question, That's Bill. a tough one. And it's a tough one. Uh, and there are some proposals that are kicking around the legislature. Um, there's uh, a bill that's been uh, in play for a while on single-payer health care. Um, and then there are some other proposals that would allow uh, business, businesses, private citizens, to opt into some of the public insurances that currently exist. Math Health is not a bad deal. It's not a bad deal. And I do think... Um, you know, if, if the residents of the Commonwealth are willing to have a conversation, right? Do we need to set up a commission to study our own public option for the GIC or for Mass Health? Uh, would that help us stabilize some of the rising health care costs? And I think that that's a legislative proposal that I could certainly get behind. Um, I think that there's some complexities layered in there, uh, but Bill, uh, employers are simply not in a position. Uh, to be able to offer health care, the Not cost is astronomical. If you talk to any small business owner uh, who's thinking about those 36 hours, um, most of them are thinking that's going to be um, the death nail in my it's, business. It's, it's a deal breaker. No, absolutely. So to that end, we've heard uh, President Biden signal that he would love to, uh, if he's able to build uh, the numbers in the Senate and the House, uh, a public option. Uh, that was a conversation that came up yep. when we first did the Affordable Care Act. And as a commonwealth, I think we need to ask ourselves if one of our values is uh, we want people to have access to health care. Um, and right now we have the mandate for uh, coverage. So we have pretty high coverage. But the question that you're asking is about cost. Is it the time to think about leading the way when it comes to a public option for our residents and for our small businesses? It may be time to consider that. I mean, COVID was, a, was an awakening that an employer-based healthcare uh, insurance system might not necessarily be uh, the future, uh, given that at any time a business could fold over, and we saw that in the midst of the pandemic. So I, I certainly think that it's well past time for us to have a real conversation about the status of healthcare and healthcare access and health equity. Um, and one of the solutions for our small businesses is to consider that public option. It is, a, insurance basically can break a business and break a person. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Fiscal year 2023 in Massachusetts, the budget looks like it's coming in at just under $50 billion. That just boggles my mind, even though it's a big, you know, it's a good sized state. Uh, and we have uh, unexpected higher tax revenues coming up, and I use the air quotes for that, uh, unexpected higher tax revenues that have come in this year. And there's an impressive budget surplus. I couldn't quite find a precise number for that, but it's somewhere between one and a half billion and $2 billion that we have and a budget surplus coming up. Should the legislature be looking to relieve the taxpayers in some way in view of the extra revenues and the big surplus? Or should every effort be made to continue as is and build the surplus more? Mm. Yeah, these are the great questions, Bill. I, I, I do my best, you know. It, uh, it, I really think that these are questions that, that people want to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're questions that should be asked. It's a, a you know, $50 billion budget. That's Absolutely. So I, I think uh, the first thing I'll say is that budgets are policy documents. They speak to the values that we have as a state. We spend a significant portion of the budget, I think close to like 40, 45 percent on health care costs. That's mm -hmm. mass health, the administration of it. Then we spend on education, um, the labor programs that exist, um, and some of the other um, salaries that uh, account for that in our government, the legislature, um, the administration. And I do think that, um, you know, as we think about that number, 49 and a half billion dollars, uh, unexpected tax revenues that are coming in higher, 
And yeah, it's time for us to consider it. We've already heard from Senate President Spilka, Speaker Mariano, that they have an interest in doing so. The governor's made a proposal already. You know, what this looks like, uh, it could be a combination of a few things. Uh, some folks have advocated for uh, a gas tax uh, holiday, which we've seen other states do, but I think that that's pretty short-sighted. Gas tax holidays are smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors. They really are. Agreed. I mean, it's nice for a weekend, but... Exactly. So I, I think that the, the, the piece here is, you know, what kind of relief would actually touch the lives of people? What, what, what can we do? Uh, so I, I think about proposals um, that I've put forth that I would want to prioritize around property taxes as an example. Could we finally take a look at the thresholds for income to um, really uh, qualify for some of the senior uh, tax credits that you could receive for volunteering as an example to re reduce your property tax value. Now that might be an opportunity. With some of this excess collection, is there an opportunity to send something back to the taxpayer directly into their hands? We know that uh, folks received that stimulus and they were able to use it uh, for the purposes of uh, buying groceries for their family, putting something away for a rainy day fund, making that car repair. Uh, and so I do think that um, it could be cash out the door. Uh, it could be uh, doubling down on some of the investments that we're making. In the House budget just this year, as an example, we're using this excess tax collection to ensure that we have universal meals for our kids in schools. We know that the pandemic uh, revealed just how deep uh, poverty can be, but also uh, the hunger crisis. Uh, and I think we need to be really thoughtful about where folks are at with the rising cost of inflation. So we have like two things happening at the same time. We have this increase in tax revenue collection, but then we also still have real tremendous needs for our residents. Uh, so I would ask folks to think about like what our priorities are. Um, it's, it should be helping seniors, helping our school children to make sure that they have what they need to receive an education, that they can receive those meals while they're at school, but also extending uh, some of those types of investments out to um, the other populations that are so incredibly vulnerable. I think about our veterans, I think about those who are living in deep poverty, that are homeless, and how can we uh, marshal some of these resources in a supplemental budget that reaches directly into the hands of residents when we empower them to use funds, uh, I think that they're gonna do what's best for themselves. Uh, so to that end, I'm supportive of the general concept. We have some additional sources of revenue that are on the horizon uh, with respect to uh, conversations around sports betting. So we right. are gonna see some additional revenues coming into the Commonwealth aside from our current tax collection. So I do think that there is a solution out there. It's a matter of uh, what are our values? What, what do we wanna do? What's the approach? Uh, but right now what we're hearing from uh, the leadership on both sides and uh, the House and the Senate and from the governor is that they wanna come together to do something. So we should expect probably uh, closer to July that there will be a proposal on the table. Uh, and I'm sure it's something that we can all live with. Well, that'll be nice to see. So you, you used the term supplemental budget, which uh, brings up another subject near and dear to my heart. Now, Salem right now is going through their own budget process. Counselors get the budget about you know, five weeks out. And uh, it's a good sized budget, $188 million, which boggles my mind also. Uh, and they have about a month to figure that out and then vote to pass or not pass the budget. Now they'll pass the budget. We all know that's going to happen. Salem's budget is always ready for July 1st and, and the city's ready to run. Not passing a budget creates an issue where technically the government shuts down. We've seen it at the national level a couple of times. And then you have to pass a supplemental budget to keep the state running or the city running in the process. Massachusetts seems unable year from year to year to pass the budget on time and has developed a, a reputation for being a, a, a state that can't pass it on time and we always end up creating supplemental budgets which have to cost more in the long run. It slows the process down. Um, why, why can't, the, why, why doesn't the legislator, legislature have this ability to pass a budget on time? What, what's, is it, is it the governor legislator thing? Is it the politics? Mm. Can the Massachusetts legislature <laughs> next year, the year after, can they pass a budget on time and not have to create a supplemental budget? 
so uh, it's an interesting question, Bill. So here's how I'm going to answer it. Uh, usually in the first uh, year of the session, the budget is on time. Uh, it makes it to July, July 1st, and uh, the conference committee wraps up. The second year of the legislative session is a lot more difficult because at that point you're wrestling with two different things. You've got the legislative process, which is in full swing. You've moved past what's known as Joint Rule 10, in which all bills have to be discharged from their first committee. Uh, and then you have the budget process running at the same exact time. And sometimes what will happen with the budget on both the House and the Senate side is that policy riders will be added to the budget in the outside sections. And that is where usually the hangups will occur with respect to the budget. Uh, and so that means that legislators will have attached legislation to the budget in an effort to try to get their priorities through. And sometimes it's the leadership of both the House and the Senate that puts forward some type of provision and then it ends up being way more difficult to reconcile your budgets. Uh, and so we saw that occur in a couple of different sessions. Uh, and then during the pandemic, there was a year, uh, I think it was the first year, uh, 2020, uh, of the pandemic, that the budget wasn't done until November right. because of all the uncertainty. So the legislature always has the option not to submit on time, uh, and they can do kind of these stopgap budgets from time to time, a six month, a 12 month uh, to 12 month budget. And uh, it's a good policy tool. I understand the concerns that folks might have, uh, but for the most part, um, I think they get it in relatively on time. Where they get hung up on is the policy. So that to me speaks to the need to have um, a stronger legislative process with respect to the agreements that happen between the House and the Senate on how they want to handle conference committees when it comes to legislation so that they don't get attached. And then you're just horse trading on the budget number so that you can reconcile. Um, uh, so to that end, uh, I do think you know one of the things that I would say uh, to my colleagues uh, if I was in the legislature would be, Let's try to solve the legislation during the legislative calendar, and then let's focus when it comes to the budget on the, the numbers, because that's fundamentally what the residents of the Commonwealth are waiting for, services, rental vouchers, food Absolutely. vouchers, mass health, where do we land on staffing? Um, and so the supplemental budgets, I think, um, are really important because it does allow, from a policy perspective, us as a state to be nimble, and sometimes they're focused in particular areas. So supplemental budgets sometimes will be released, and the focus might be on additional local aid that's needed, all right, because we have stronger uh, revenues that come in, and municipalities might need a little bit more help. Or maybe we need to stabilize our healthcare system, and we absolutely need to take some of those uh, dollars that we put away to do that. Uh, so to that end, uh, I won't knock supplemental budgets. I think that they're really important appropriations that do help solve um, the year-to-year -year challenges that'll come up in the Commonwealth. Good defense of a system that I detest, absolutely. <laughs> but you've given me food for thought that I, I need to think that over a little bit. Uh, the legislature obviously is a very leadership forward body as opposed to the Salem City Council or even the school committee, which is really more member driven than leader driven, uh, especially the city council. Uh, in the legislature, it's really important to, I'm not gonna say go along to get along, but you need, you need to be able to collaborate and work with the leaders. If you don't, you're not gonna be effective at all within that. So that, that plays into the budget process, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that's in the budget this year that the governor has vetoed are licenses for illegal aliens or undocumented immigrants, whichever term people use out there. Uh, the governor has vetoed that in the state. The legislature, I'm assuming, is not going to allow that veto to stand. Where do you stand on the issue, issuance of driver's licenses to the undocumented immigrants in Massachusetts? Yeah, so the term I definitely use is undocumented uh, immigrants. Um, uh, and yeah. um, I, I certainly am supportive of these uh, driver's licenses uh, for the purposes of, number one, public safety, dignity, uh, and ensuring that people can get to work. Uh, undocumented residents here in the Commonwealth are everywhere. They are a part of our community. Um, they have kids in our public schools. They're human beings. And fundamentally, when we think about that legislation and what it means uh, for our residents who have lived in the shadows, uh, it means that they'll be able to bring their kids to school without the fear 
of being pulled over and then somehow ending up in immigration proceedings. Um, and so to that end, certainly in support of the legislation, and I've been in support of it since I worked in Rep. Matias's office, and then when I was in Rep. Tucker's office, we worked with the mass major chiefs who have endorsed the bill. So our chiefs of police, from a policy perspective, in 351 cities and towns have come together to endorse that bill. The one uh, place that I would uh, just uh, correct the record is that that was not included in the budget. It was standalone legislation. All right. So the House passed the bill first, then the Senate, uh, they had a conference committee to reconcile a couple of differences, and then they put the bill in front of the governor, and then he, re uh, then he uh, vetoed the legislation. Was there not financing for RMV to implement these programs in the budget? Uh, there may have been that? funding, right? Yeah, okay. but it wasn't yeah. the bill itself. Right. So the bill was separate from the budget process, okay. which wrapped yeah. up. But the, you're correct that the governor vetoed the legislation. Yes. And based on the numbers of uh, legislators who voted in support of the driver's license bill, um, there's a veto-proof majority. So and the governor knows that. And it's politics. I mean, it's understood. Yeah, it's, and that's if that's the way that he decides to lead, that's his prerogative. Uh, what I would say to folks who might have concerns about this is to spend the time uh, with a chief of police. If you take a look at just Rep. Tucker's record on the issue alone, when he was the Salem police chief, he was sending a letter in support of this because in this community we understood that anyone who gets behind the wheel should have the same level of training, classifications, uh, to ensure that they can safely travel from point A to point B. Um, and these licenses, you know, one of the misnomers that the governor put out there was uh, that this will be used as a way for folks to register to vote. There's no evidence you of that whatsoever. You just took my follow-up question yeah. right up, right and up. That, yeah. That's totally red meat uh, for the base. Um, and I would instead ask folks to really uh, spend the time with your favorite restaurant owner, spend the time with um, community organizations, some of the churches, and they'll tell you some of the harrowing stories of these folks and the way that they contribute to our economy. And a driver's license um, is the least that we can do um, to ensure that they have dignity in their lives. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, you can go up to Walmart, uh, Walmart, Home Depot any day and see that the group of guys, of people, they're looking for work, that they're just waiting for somebody to come along and uh, give them a day's work. So, yes, it, red meat is a good term for the, the voting concerns. I mean, there are already steps in place to, to prevent that sort of voter fraud. Um, most of these issues are driven, of course, by the fact that people have a very, immigrants have a very, whether they be undocumented or documented, have a very long, torturous road to citizenship in this country. How do we change that? What can we do to make it easier for people that have stayed out of trouble, that are working and trying to support a family? What can we do to get, provide, create, not just in the state, but nationally, uh, uh, an easier road to citizenship, one that doesn't take so long? Well, great question, Bill. I, uh, I'm not running for Congress, so to be clear, that is a federal matter uh, when it comes to citizenship. That's not something the state could offer to... Uh, but they can advocate. We can certainly advocate. Uh, so to that end, you know, I think that as we have this conversation about immigration in our country, I think we need to take a look at the full picture, right? The fabric in which... Um, the, the, the fabric of our country, the story of America is one of immigration. Uh, and these folks that have arrived un, undocumented, so many of them are contributing to um, our quality of life here. And let's think about the moment in time that we're in, in a country, as a country. We have a global pandemic. We have workforce shortages in certain areas. And we have a real need uh, for um, trying to address this challenge of what do we do about the folks that are here? So I think about the opportunities that we've created for dreamers um, and how do we extend that uh, to some of these folks? So for some of them, it's expanded uh, what's called TPS uh, or temporary protective status for those that might be fleeing particular situations. Uh, for others, it might be creating a pathway to citizenship that's tied to employment, that's tied to military service, that might be tied to volunteer service. Uh, and then for others, it might be that they pay a particular fee and then they go through legal proceedings to just examine their case. Uh, but to do that, uh, we're gonna need some increased capacity in the federal courts. There's a backlog of 
immigration cases dating back to the Obama administration. Uh, and that's why it takes so long is because we don't have enough folks uh, in that space. So I would certainly hope that uh, if we wanted to get aspirational about where the federal government should go with respect to addressing the status of undocumented immigrants in our country, that they think about the capacity of the courts to handle the cases, the need for civil legal representation to ensure that people can get the documentation that they need to be able to prove their stay, but then also um, we need to have the collective conversation about what are the pathways and what do they look like, and they might be different, uh, but we should certainly be thinking about the ways in which um, we can create opportunities for the exact kind of folks that you're describing, uh, which are mostly law-abiding. Um, these folks are raising Pay children in this working, country. And paying working. taxes. And paying taxes. <laughs> and paying taxes. Yep. So let's uh, ease it up a little bit. Uh, still an important uh, point to discuss. Uh, Salem's political office holders over the years have not seen a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. We've seen some. Latinos on the council. Uh, we now have our first black on the council. Um, we've had uh, one Asian woman on the council. We've had multiple women on the council before and now. I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you may know better than I do, this is the first time we've ever had two Latinos uh, running against each other in Salem for a city for for office, whether it be citywide office or statewide office, uh, how do you feel about that? Where do you think that puts us? Uh, is 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 this a, a visible sign of progress or just circumstance? Mm. Mm. These are the questions. These are good questions. I Bill. thought this was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would. We also have a third candidate who's he, in the race. Yeah, uh, if he turns in his signatures and, papers, and who's African American, who's an African American and man. So yes. that's the first time in Salem's history where all the candidates are uh, either black, Latino, or people of color. City for a state in a citywide race. Too. In a yeah. citywide race, and I think that that speaks to what I believe at my core, which is that Salem has changed, as it always does. Uh, Salem has went, welcomed uh, our French Canadian immigrants, Irish, the Polish, Russian, um, more recent waves of immigration from the Dominican Republic and parts of Latin America. Um, and uh, it's exciting to see that that's the case. And unlike uh, some of the other races that you and I have both experienced, it's very clear to me that um, the discourse in this race is different. It's uh, more positive. You know, I've seen my fellow candidates at different functions and events. I have personal relationships with at least one of the candidates, um, but it's grounded in respect and knowing that this is a historic moment and that the, the city should really celebrate the fact that this is the state of the leadership. Now, uh, of course, it's a race um, and there's only gonna be one winner here, uh, but fundamentally, Salem is gonna have its first person of color serving in the legislature, which is incredibly exciting and certainly hope that that person is me. Um, and if it's not, I'll do everything that I can to support that state representative to ensure that they're successful in their first term. Now, to that end, you asked a question about representation. Uh, I'm the first Afro-Latino vice chair of our Salem School Committee. And uh, one of the responsibilities that I believe we bear as being the first is ensuring that we're not the last. Uh, and as a leader, you know, one of the things that I've prided myself on in this race has been uh, the opportunity to try to create more leadership amongst um, people of color in our community. So uh, both here in Salem and then more broadly. So I think it's really important that uh, leaders of color are at the forefront of mentoring others who might someday run for public office, uh, either in Salem or across the community. I've got an open door policy. So there is a person of color who is watching this and thinking to themselves, I'm inspired, I wanna get involved and maybe I wanna run, give me a call. I'm happy to mentor you, happy to tell you all about running for public office. I've got this great kitchen cabinet of folks. Um, I appreciate you raising earlier that we have our first black American serving on the city council. Um, and you know, I, I'm excited about Lev McLean's leadership. I think he brings a different style to the council that we haven't seen before. So that lived experience is something we have to honor. And in my kitchen cabinet, I've invited people of color to serve there. And that's you know, something that I think is a small way that people can really elevate the civic discourse in communities of color. So I'm gonna encourage all of our other elected officials, as you're thinking about who advises you when you run for public office, make sure that you've got more than a few seats for people of color. Council McLean brings a subtle, quiet intensity 
with him in the meetings that, that I've noticed. Uh, interesting, interesting addition to the council. I think he's the most interesting addition to the council in the last few years just for that. Uh, there's, a, there's thought processes going on there, and I'm curious to see where they go. So I think that's about it, Manny. Uh, unless you've got something else you want to add, I'm just going to say thank you very much for coming in, and uh, best of luck. Thank you so much, Bill. Really appreciate the time. The only thing that I'll add is that we do have the primary on September 6th, and I've served this community for the last four years. I have the experience of working in the legislature and advocating on the other side of the table to ensure that our residents have what they need. I believe that fundamentally in this race, we need experienced leadership on Beacon Hill that can ensure that here in Salem, we can lead out front with our values, tackle the issues that are facing our residents. Uh, we have an affordable housing crisis that's going to require us to have a legislator on day one who's prepared uh, to file policy solutions that will ensure that residents can remain in their home. We are a coastal community that is at risk of the worst disasters when it comes to climate change and mitigation. Uh, and so we need to be ensuring that we're electing a state representative uh, who will lead this climate justice community uh, into securing more state funding so that we can raise up our seawalls and our coastal resiliency. And then lastly, the people that have been most impacted disproportionately by this impact uh, of the impacts of this um, pandemic have been our children. I think about the interrupted learning that they've been experiencing. I've been a leader on public education reform at both the local and the state level, and we're already seeing the impacts of the Student Opportunity Act not reaching Salem. We had a $3 million shortfall within our budget on the school committee, and we had to resolve that. And I know uh, from the conversations that I've had around the Chapter 70 formula uh, that I can work with leaders in education reform to be able to address this to ensure that our educators and our students have what they need so that we can equitably recover from this pandemic. So four years ago, the residents of Salem entrusted me with my leadership on the school committee, and I'm asking them to give me their vote on September 6th. Thank you. Very nice. One more time. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Bill. And uh, we'll, we'll see what happens on September 6th. That's it, guys. This is William Legault of Salem Digest here in the Salem Access Television Studios at 285 Derby Street. Nice chat with state representative candidate and sitting school committee member, vice chair school committee member, Manny Cruz. Thank you very much and uh, best of luck.